Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, invites you to Be the Informed Patient with the podcast that features experts from Central New York's only academic medical center. I'm your host, Amber Smith. The disorder known as hydrocephalus happens when excess cerebrospinal fluid in the ventricles of the brain compress brain tissue. A neurosurgeon at Upstate has dedicated a good portion of his career to caring for patients with hydrocephalus while also researching this disorder to find new treatment options. Now Upstate Medical is teaming up with another SUNY school, Binghamton University, to expand some of this research. Here to tell us about that partnership is Dr. Satish Krishnamurthy. He's a professor of neurosurgery who specializes in pediatric neurosurgery, neurocritical care, and minimally invasive surgery. Welcome to The Informed Patient, Dr. Krishnamurthy. Thank you so much for asking me to speak. It's a delight to be back talking about hydrocephalus, which is such a common disorder. It's one of the most common disorders that affects the brain at all ages and especially children. What happens is that, as you said, there is excess fluid buildup in the brain that causes dysfunction of the brain, which can result in both physical and mental handicap. What percent of the population may be affected by hydrocephalus? You said it's common, but how many people? Numbers just in this country are 70,000 admissions for hydrocephalus every year. And the country itself spends $2 billion every year on treatment of hydrocephalus. Globally, it's a much bigger problem because there are many varieties of hydrocephalus that can occur. Most common is when you're born, you have intraventricular hemorrhage, which is blood in the brain, or in some countries, like in African continent, mostly because of infection that occurs in childhood. But anyone can get hydrocephalus. You can get it from head injury. You can get it from infections. You can get it from brain tumors. And you can get it even in old age. Uh, It's called normal pressure hydrocephalus. Nothing normal about it. It's a strange name for this disorder, but a large section of the population is affected. It's as common as juvenile diabetes. Does hydrocephalus affect the young and the old and men and women equally? Yes, it does. There is no age or genetic differences. And that's one of the things that we are interested in studying is to see who actually is susceptible for hydrocephalus. And this is very important because a lot of people are subjected to brain infections and blood clots in the brain, but not all of them get hydrocephalus. So it's important to see, am I, are you susceptible to hydrocephalus more often than other people around us? And if so, how do we identify them? How do we protect them or treat them early? The researchers from Binghamton University are from the Thomas J. Watson College of Engineering and Applied Science, and they're studying with you and your students the underlying cause of hydrocephalus. Is that right? Yes. I've been studying hydrocephalus for a little over two decades now. And the primary problem with understanding hydrocephalus is what we conceive causes hydrocephalus. So there is a popular theory which basically states that there is water that is produced inside the brain from choroid plexus. It's an organelle inside the brain, like a tap that produces water and water goes around in a particular pattern. And when the water flow is interrupted or excess water is created, then you get hydrocephalus. However, the brain, like all other organs in our body, excepting for our teeth, is permeable to water, which makes it difficult to understand the circulation model, which needs impermeable brain. So what we came up with as a concept was to think of brain as a tea bag instead of a plastic So water goes where the tea leaves are, just like the water goes up the root and supplies water to the tea leaf or any large tree, right? So we have worked on a different concept where there are protein molecules and macromolecules that are secreted into the fluid spaces. And of course, when you have a blood clot or infection, you get more of the cells coming into the fluid. 
and this can draw water and build hydrocephalus. So there are several things that are of interest when we started our partnership with Binghamton University. One is to look at the fluid and say, what is the difference between the fluid that is normal, that's in normal people, and the people who have hydrocephalus? Is there more of the garbage that is in the fluid? And how do you analyze how much there is and what kind of garbage there is with that interest that if we know what kind of garbage, we can make it go away faster with a medication or some other means. So Dr. Frank Liu, who is a uh, investigator and faculty assistant professor in Binghamton University, he is collaborating with us to figure out what sort of changes are in the composition of the fluid. He uses a special method called Raman spectroscopy, which is interesting that it does not change the protein. Normally, chemical analysis involves breaking down the protein and figuring out and building the blocks up again. But Raman spectroscopy actually keeps the protein intact. And it also helps us to use Raman spectroscopy in the ICU if we want it, because it's just the light that goes through the fluid and gives us the data on how much proteins there are and what to do when there is excess. So there is another project with Binghamton, which is with the study of mechanical flow through the tubes. Common treatment for hydrocephalus is to put in a shunt, which is the tube that is placed inside the brain ventricles, which is the fluid spaces, and the tube goes down in the belly. Now, I told you that this country spends $2 billion. $1 billion goes into putting in new shunts. That's the tube. And the other billion goes into fixing the tubes that are broken or blocked. So when a person who has a shunt comes to the emergency room with headache, we do expensive tests to figure out whether the tube is working or not. Uh, scan, x-rays, and all of that. It's not just an inconvenience, but it adds to the radiation that the patient receives. In addition to a constant tour of Damocle on your head when you have a shunt, so the other project that I'm working with, Dr. Kierat, who's the department chair, and his associate, Peter Yu, is to look at how we can actually detect flow inside the tube of the shot. We're using different ways to assess that so that when you come in, when you have a shunt, you can actually say, this is working, this is not working. This is Upstate's The Informed Patient Podcast. I'm your host, Amber Smith. I'm talking with Dr. Satish Krishnamurthy about his research into hydrocephalus. So has teaming up with the engineers in Binghamton provided new ideas for how to think about hydrocephalus or even the shunts? Yes, definitely the collaborations that I have enrich the concepts and the way we think about how to treat hydrocephalus. and also accelerate research and discovery so that we can get the innovations to fruition at a much earlier time. So the Raman spectroscopy project will help us what proteins are elevated and how to get rid of the proteins. And the other project will help us with determining who has a functioning shunt and who does not have a functioning shunt. I just came out from a meeting with Dr. Frank Middleton who is the director of the Molecular Genetic Core at Upstate University. And we are looking at detecting people who are at risk for hydrocephalus. What if we have a gene set that is not very effective in clearing the garbage from the ventricle? How do you identify them? How do you make them better? And we are looking at partners to develop drugs to help move this garbage without putting in tubes. Our ultimate goal of all the research is to convert this disorder that is now treated only with surgery into something that we treat with a medication. I was going to ask, so the treatment right now is to install the shunt. Does a shunt stay there forever? Because you said one of the reasons someone may develop hydrocephalus is an infection. 
So if you put a shunt in and then the infection clears up, can you take the shunt out or will that person always have a risk of hydrocephalus? Yes, they always have a risk for hydrocephalus. Very few people do not continue to need a shunt. And the problem with the shunts are that they themselves can be prone for infection because they are foreign body. So we just finished up a two-year grant from Department of Defense, which helped us identify whether these molecules can be moved with the medication. And we have obtained some very useful results and information from that. And we are very hopeful that in the next few years, we will have a good molecule or a drug that can help transport garbage that comes into the fluid and helps steer our brains, literally. So where do you expect the research with Binghamton to lead? I would think that at least two different objectives can be obtained. One is a way to detect who is having excess protein in the intensive care unit with a device that is going to be developed as a result of our research collaboration. And the other, hopefully, would be a implantable device that can tell us whether the shunt is working or not. Right now, the shunts don't talk to us. This is one way to help shunts talk to us, like the pacemakers and other devices elsewhere in the body, especially cardiac devices. We can communicate with them. We can troubleshoot them from outside. Shunts don't have a way to do that. So we are trying to use this collaborative opportunity to help develop a device that can make the shunt talk. But it sounds like already you're using this spectroscopy on patients who are in the hospital so that you can analyze what their fluid is made up of? Right now, the answer is part yes, part no. What we are doing is take the sample, of course, with informed consent under the IRB guidance. We are taking the sample and we are transporting the sample. What we would really want to do is to use it as a standard of care to bring a portable Raman unit so that we can actually study in every patient and help every patient with the advanced technology. Not just ask a research question to get an answer, but actually help. So it's under study right now. And you mentioned IRB. I just want to let listeners know the Institutional Review Board that oversees any sort of trials or studies that are underway involving patients. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I should have mentioned that. In addition, I want to say that is to protect the patient from them feeling that they are quote unquote guinea pigs. But these are rigorous guidelines that the Institute have control over all research investigations that are done in a hospital or in any place in this country. It sounds like the work you're doing, though, is very applicable and could have an impact on people who develop hydrocephalus. Yes, I think for me, it's important to have a better treatment strategy for any person that has hydrocephalus. And I think it makes it very impersonal when we say people. I think if you look at the little five-year-old that has had seven shunt surgeries and has got many scars and is traumatized and hasn't had a normal life in the first five years, we would understand very clearly how important this is and how time urgent it is. And I'm really hopeful that we will be able to put a drug on the table instead of having surgery as the only option for treatment of hydrocephalus. Well, your work is very encouraging, and I appreciate you making time to tell us about it, Dr. Krishnamurthy. It's an absolute delight, and thank you for asking me to share our research with everyone. And it does take a village. We have over 20 people that have contributed to this research. My guest has been Dr. Satish Krishnamurthy, a professor of neurosurgery at Upstate who is known for his extensive research on hydrocephalus treatments. The Informed Patient is a podcast covering health, science, and medicine, brought to you by Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, and produced by Jim Howe. Find our archive of previous episodes at upstate.edu slash informed. If you enjoyed this episode, please tell a friend to listen too. 
And you can rate and review the Informed Patient Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you tune in. This is your host, Amber Smith, thanking you for listening.